Welcome Biz2C students. As we end the quarter and prepare for our final exam, I thought I would make a lecture for you that comprehensively covers all the topics in Biz2C. This isn't like a normal lecture. It combines all 37 hours of lecture into just one. So let's get comfortable, grab your notes, and get ready to prepare for the final exam. So we just spent the past 10 weeks covering the Tree of Life. And one of the first questions I have for you is what are the big takeaways for you? What topics were most important to you? What's really sticking out in your mind now, even though your brain may be a little taxed uh, with all kinds of upcoming finals, what were the big takeaways for you in this class? I'll give you a few moments to think about that. Now my list is obviously going to look a lot different than your list, but I've been teaching Biz2C for a while and it really stands out as a class to me that can start to not only transform your understanding of biodiversity, but really start to make connections across many aspects of biology. And that's one of the important things that this class does for me. I would argue that Biz2C really provides you with foundational knowledge about organisms, but also about organizational structure in terms of phylogeny so that you can better understand and interpret many aspects of the biology you're about to learn about, like in your upper division classes. So let's start out with phylogeny. This is where we began 10 weeks ago, so we're going to start here. So the first thing I'll ask is, you know, I whenever I think about Biz2C, the first thing I think about is, well, why phylogeny? How are we going to organize this diversity of life? There's 1.3 million species that have been described, but the best estimates are there are about 8.7 million species total. So as you can see, there's a big gap there. And as we discover new things, we're going to want to describe them in such a way that we produce a classification that's informative, not only in terms of species identity, but in making predictions about what species are like, what characters they have, and how they've evolved. Now I'm going to go on record and say that most biologists really don't build phylogenies, but nearly all biologists use them. So we spend some time, especially in lab, talking about building phylogenies using parsimony. In lecture, this is usually reduced only because modern methods of building phylogenies are pretty sophisticated and require some in-depth understanding of statistics. Now phylogenies have great power. It's not really just in the relationships that they show. So when we look at the hug et al phylogeny that we've used throughout the quarter, this really gives us a framework of the tree of life, which is super helpful, but it's also in that phylogenies help us to understand evolutionary pattern and process. And we've used phylogenies in a number of ways in this class. I gave you some great case studies. One, of course, with Kimberly Bergalis and using phylogenies to sort of investigate from a forensic perspective um, how she ended up with her disease. We use phylogenies in conservation biology by thinking about giraffes and how many species there actually are of giraffes and how that implicates or has implications for uh, conservation and management of giraffes in Africa. We used it to sort of better understand the origins of life. So we used a case study trying to think about what LUCA was, i.e. the last universal common ancestor. And then last but not least, we used phylogenies in many respects to explore topics of human health. Here we talked about plasmodium, the microbial eukaryote that causes malaria, and we used phylogenies to show that plasmodium is polyphyletic, which likely has implications on how we're going to end up pursuing treatment. Now we use lots of other case studies throughout the class, but this highlights some of the important examples. I said this multiple times in lecture, but I'll repeat it again. Homology, i.e. similarity due to common ancestry, is a core and central concept in biology. It's really easy to be misled. When you look at characteristics, you can start to think that maybe they're the result of common ancestry, but 
after this class, he realized that homoplasy, convergent evolution, is really rampant across the tree of life, even in characteristics that you don't expect. Now, flight is one really good example of homoplasy, and we used bat wings and bird wings in addition to the evolution of flight in insects, the evolution of flight in um, pterosaurs to show that uh, flight evolved within animals four different times. So that's a good example of convergent evolution. Now when we look more closely at bird wings and bat wings, for example, you now know that birds and bats are both tetrapod animals, and as such, the bones that comprise the wings can be easily homologized. Those, those bones look similar because they're the result of ancestry. There were lots of other examples of homoplasy that we used during the class. One of the great ones was in bacteria and archaea. So if you look at this hot spring, you might think, oh yeah, bacteria probably don't occur here. Maybe it's just archaea because they like those extreme environments. But remember that hyperthermophily evolved multiple times independently. Not only that, but the body morphology of bacteria and archaea themselves evolved multiple times independently. We gave examples not only in bacteria and archaea and in animals, but also in plants where we have the independent evolution of heterospory in seed plants and in lycophytes, and of course, vessel elements, which also occur in angiosperms and neophytes. So lots of examples of homoplasy, and given enough time, things do independently evolve, even in characteristics that you might not otherwise expect. Another example of homoplasy is multicellularity. Remember, multicellularity evolved multiple times in the tree of life. Several bacteria are multicellular, at least for part of their life cycle, like stigmatella here. But plants and animals are also multicellular. Remember that all animals are multicellular, and most plants are. And one piece of evidence that argues that the multicellularity in plants and animals evolved independently is that plants have different kinds of cell-to-cell -cell junctions. Remember, in animals, you have tight junctions, gap junctions, and desmosomes, which are unique to them. Now, before this class, you might not have expected that something like a bacterium could be considered multicellular. Something like anabana is important. You can see here it's a string of beads. Remember that header assist in the middle is where we get nitrogen fixation. But stigmatella kind of challenges our understanding of multicellularity. Remember, we defined multicellularity in Biz2C as some cells in the body give up the ability to reproduce. In stigmatella, the base here is not reproductive, but the top part is. But most of the time, stigmatella lives on its own in a unicellular stage. So it's kind of interesting that we get independent evolution of multicellularity, and it's all a little bit different. So there must be some huge advantage to multicellularity that um, uh, not only microbes, but plants and animals have exploited. So moving on from phylogeny, we'll go to the tree of life. And the first most important thing that I really want to emphasize to you is that all life is descended from a single common ancestor. That single common ancestor we refer to in this class as LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And where and how LUCA lived is not really clear, but it's really clear that the characteristics shared by all living things are universal homologies and support the, I, the fact that life descended one time from a single common ancestor. If you look at some of the evidence, you can see things like all life being cellular. You can see DNA being comprised of A, T, C, and G, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. You can see that all life more or less uses the same three-letter genetic code. All proteins are made the same way. From DNA to RNA to proteins, 
in a process we call the central dogma through transcription and translation. And last but not least, all living things have ribosomes, and ribosomes are the organelle that allows the central dogma to occur. If you remember back to the very beginning, we made a timeline that sort of illustrated many of the major ideas and the development of the tree of life. We started with ideas like Darwin in 1859, who had a really good conceptual idea of what the tree of life was like, but didn't use really any data. He just tried to kind of come up with the idea of common ancestry. Later on, we have trees like the tree produced by Haeckel, which started to organize things into plants, protists, and animals. Again, no real data. Whitaker was in 1969, and Whitaker relied on ecological aspects and really physiology, how these organisms got their nutrition, either by ingestion, absorption, or photosynthesis. Finally, we get to the 70s, where we get the discovery of archaea by Carl Woese, who relied on ribosomes to infer a tree of life using data. Later on, we get the invention of PCR, and we start to see people like Norman Pace develop even more robust trees, not only using a lot more data, but sampling a lot more diverse habitats. This is about the time when we start to see so-called culture-independent DNA studies taking over. And then more recently, we have our hug at all phylogeny, which is based on whole genomes and includes sampling from all kinds of taxa that have never even been seen before in environmental samples. Just to punctuate this a little bit, I'm going to add some discoveries that were pretty important in biology along the way. So in the 50s, we get DNA structure. So the concept of the tree of life had been around for a long time. In, in 1967, we get the idea of endosymbiosis really taking root with Lynn Margulis. In 1983, we get the invention of PCR. That's about the same time that the internet was invented, just to kind of give you some perspective. In 2005, we get the development of next generation DNA sequencing methods, which allow a lot higher throughput um, in contrast to PCR. And it was just in 2010 that we have the discovery of those Asgard archaea, which are more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to other archaea. So you can see in just this short period of time from like 2005 to the present, we've really, the, the, our understanding of the tree of life has absolutely blossomed. And so this I expect to continue as we not only develop new technologies, but explore more and more interesting habitats. So moving on to bacteria and archaea, the first thing that really occurs to me is that microbial diversity is absolutely overwhelming. And we have only recently developed the tools and technologies to really efficiently explore microbes as a whole. So let alone understand their ecology or their interactions, we're just at the very, very tip of starting to understand microbes. So remember, when I say microbe, usually I'm referring to bacteria and archaea strictly, but there are eukaryotes that are also microbial. If you look at this recent phylogeny from Hug et al. in 2016, among the things that you should notice is that only a small fraction of the organisms on this tree have ever been grown in pure lab cultures. And in fact, most of the organisms on this tree really emphasize how little we know. So everything in red here has never had a pure culture made. They're only no, known from environmental samples. Now relative to eukaryotes, among the things that stand out about bacteria and archaea is that they're metabolically a lot more diverse. So many microbes are really important players in ecosystems, especially bacteria, which are absolutely key to the nitrogen cycle. Remember that most of the organisms that you are most familiar with, things like animals and fungi, are chemoorganoheterotrophs. 
But bacteria and archaea can really do just about everything else. And so there's a huge range of different kinds of trophy that bacteria and archaea can do. Notice that cyanobacteria are photolithoautotrophs with plants, and there's good reason for that, because the reason why plants can even do photosynthesis is through a symbiosis with cyanobacteria. When you look at bacteria and archaea in terms of their cells, they're superficially similar. As I showed you before, there's only three main morphologies, the caucus, the bacillus, and the helical form, but there's a lot of other more fine-scale differences. So remember that in bacteria, we have a special sort of coating called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is only present in bacteria. There's two possible arrangements for that. Gram-positive bacteria have a thick layer of peptidoglycan on the outside of their cells, and then gram-negative bacteria have a thin layer of peptidoglycan in between the two cell membranes. If you look even more closely, bacteria and eukaryotes have a different kind of arrangement of uh, phospholipid linkages. They actually have ester linkages. So here's your phosphate group, your sugar, and the ester. And then when you look at archaea, it's a little bit different. Not only is the um, sugar flipped, but we also have an ether linkage. So archaea are really defined in part by this ether linkage in addition to a few other characters, but otherwise they're very similar to bacteria. Remember though, archaea lack peptidoglycan. Only bacteria have peptidoglycan. Both bacterial and archaeal genomes are haploid, so there's no meiosis. So one thing that you might start to think is, well, if there's no meiosis and there's then no sort of new genetic combinations revol resulting from sexual reproduction, how do we end up with so much genetic diversity? Remember, bacteria and archaea essentially replicate by making clo clones of themselves in a process called binary fission. But they're also able to exchange genes between them regardless of their ancestry. So this is uh, something called lateral gene transfer, and it allows for the exchange of DNA across lineages. So this is something that can happen between even distantly related taxa. So if you think, think, of, think about it, lateral gene transfer can even happen between bacteria and archaea, which despite their morphological similarities, are really very different lineages on the tree of life. Recall that lateral gene transfer has essentially three mechanisms. Conjugation, which is shown here, which is the exchange usually of really small pieces of extra chromosomal DNA called plasmids. Then there's transformation in which a cell that dies, it lyses and releases its DNA into the environment, and bacteria or archaea can then come along and pick that up, incorporating it into its chromosomal DNA, and or transduction in which you have a exchange of DNA across lineages that's mediated by some kind of virus. So there's actually three mechanisms for the exchange of DNA across lineages. Now, despite the fact that they are unicellular, bacteria and archaea have mechanisms by which they can coordinate their actions. So, in some sense, this makes them kind of behave like multicellular organisms. The big example that we talked about in class is called quorum sensing, and quorum sensing is shown here, where you have cells that release specific signals called autoinducers, and those specific signals are received by receptors in the cell. And so as the population of bacteria and archaea continues to grow, the concentration of autoinducers also increases. Eventually, a threshold is reached. And when a certain threshold is reached in terms of concentration, all kinds of new behavioral genes are expressed. So these group behavior genes can be related to virulence, they can be also related 
to the formation of biofilms. Remember, in a biofilm, you have single cells that eventually congregate into an irreversible attached sort of film, usually on some kind of substrate. Once they're in this film, they're also still communicating with one another and ultimately recruit a really diverse and robust and very uh, protected biofilm that's called a mature biofilm. And good examples of biofilms we talked a lot about in class. One great example is dental plaque, which is really tough because it's lots of different organisms that have secreted this substance, plaque, that makes them really tough and hard to dislodge. Remember that not all microbes are really bad. There's a kind of a cultural misperception that bacteria are somehow really, really dangerous. And while some species are, most species are not. Remember, in archaea, there's no known pathogens. The overwhelming majority of bacteria, though, are really beneficial, not only in terms of ecosystem services, like nitrogen fixation, but also that all living things are sort of covered in this cloud of microbes. And this is really a complex, dynamic ecosystem. And with so many cells, it likely has a strong influence on some aspects of human health. So some classic studies that we talked about, first, if you look at the um, composition of humans, one of the things that you see is that about the first 25,000 genes or so that are expressed are actually mammalian. That's the human part of you. But when you start looking a little bit more closely, um, the second 10 million genes are of other eukaryotic or bacteria and archaeal origin. So really humans are like a super organism that's composed not only of mammalian cells, but also of bacterial, archaeal, and microbial eukaryote cells that are not really closely related to the mammalian organism that is you. Remember, another thing that stands out is that microbiomes vary on a really fine scale. So if you look at a human, that means that different parts of your body have a different composition of microbes. Sometimes it's diversity of microbes, but sometimes it's just proportion. So there's really different proportions and diversity of microbes in different parts of your body. And interestingly, this really changes depending on what sorts of things you've been exposed to. Antibiotics really disrupt um, your natural human microbiome, but it does come back. Uh, it, it, one, one thing that is also interesting is that you end up with this changing composition of the microbiome as you age. So a baby has very different composition of its microbiome, in part depending on whether or not it's breastfed, formula fed, or it gets solid food. Toddlers, again, it really just depends on so many environmental conditions, but either way, it changes as we get older. So again, emphasizing this idea that the microbiome is a complex and dynamic ecosystem. Moving on to microbial eukaryotes, remember, first and foremost, not all eukaryotes are multicellular. These microbial eukaryotes include many different lineages within eukaryotes themselves. So it includes groups in alveolates, stromenopiles, rhizarians, excavates, amoebozoans, even coanoflagellates to some extent um, can be microbial. And so microbial eukaryotes are not a monophyletic group. They do have some very specific methods of movement that you got to see in Biz2C lab. So you got to see euglena and its flagellum. Here's an amoeba with its pseudopodia. And of course, a cilia with this blepharisma, and you can see its cilia there. So although they're really diverse, all eukaryotes, at least ancestrally, have some common features. This includes a nucleus, linear DNA, membrane-bound organelles, and they use phagocytosis as a method of feeding. This makes them pretty distinct from bacterial and archaeal cells.
A central idea in eukaryotes that we talked about a lot is that eukaryotic cells really are kind of hybrid. So we have a mix of genes from both bacteria and archaea. The origins of the nucleus, mitochondria, and chloroplasts are completely different from each other. They have their own histories. When you look at something like the nucleus, the nuclear pores are oftentimes have a strong correlation with archaeal genes. And then, of course, the mitochondria is with alpha proteobacteria, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And if you look at uh, organisms like plants that have a chloroplast, then you can see that they are of cyanobacterial origin. So again, eukaryotes are kind of chimeric hybrid cells. The mitochondria, we'll start there, is really the product of primary endosymbiosis between this ancestral eukaryote that didn't have a mitochondrion, and we'll call it LECA, the last eukaryotic common ancestor, forming a symbiosis through phagocytosis with an alpha proteobacterium. Now, if you look at this phylogeny on the right, one of the things that you can notice is that all of these organisms that descend from this node are all eukaryotes. And so what we did is we sequenced the mitochondrial genes of these guys and put them together with a bunch of other bacteria whom we thought might be their close relatives. When you do that, you see that eukaryote uh, mitochondria are sister to this group called the rickettsias, which is an alpha proteobacteria. So this is pretty strong evidence of the endosymbiotic origin of the mitochondrion. Chloroplasts are also the product of primary endosymbiosis, but this time it's between a eukaryote with a mitochondrion that gained the ability to do photosynthesis by engulfing a cyanobacterium. And so we have our eukaryotic cell engulfing our cyanobacterium. This kind of ends up producing a chloroplast with lots of different membranes, in this case a few. Sometimes those get modified, but the way I always think about this is how many genomes are present. Will there be the nucleus, the chloroplast, and the mitochondrion, which is not shown here, so there would be three. If you look at the phylogeny, just like we did in the previous example, you see that what we have are a bunch of plants, both in red and green here, that are sister to, and here's the node that would define plants, sister to cyanobacteria. So this is strong evidence that the chloroplast arose again one time through some kind of endosymbiosis with some lineage of cyanobacteria. Now that becomes kind of mysterious because if the mitochondrion evolved one time, we can kind of see that all eukaryotes have mitochondria unless they're parasites. But the second thing would be that um, there's some eukaryotes that really aren't plants but can still do photosynthesis. A good example is this euglena. So we have to start thinking about that. And the way we explain that is that we have something called secondary endosymbiosis where a non-photosynthetic eukaryote gained the ability to do photosynthesis by engulfing some unicellular member of the plantae lineage. Now, it's very specific that it comes from that unicellular, me unicellular member of the plantae lineage, and that's really the definition of secondary endosymbiosis. We ask this example on questions oftentimes in lecture on an, and on exams, so it's important to make sure you try to remember that. One good piece of evidence that is uh, left behind is this nucleomorph, which is a remnant nucleus from the secondary endosymbiont. Tertiary endosymbiosis is just the next step. This is when you have a non-photosynthetic eukaryote gaining the ability to do photosynthesis by engulfing a eukaryote that previously gained the ability to do photosynthesis via secondary endosymbiosis. So this can get really complicated, as you can see in this chart here, where you have all kinds of things engulfing each other, and you end up with these crazy organisms 
with multiple genomes and membranes. A classic example of this are dinoflagellates. And if you look at the dinoflagellate um, chloroplast, which is here, one of the things that you see is that in contrast to something like a plant, which has a single membrane around its chloroplast, or maybe two, if you looked real close, in a dinoflagellate, you see all kinds of membranes surrounding that chloroplast. And some of them may have been lost, but either way, you get this really complicated set of membranes that's the result of these higher levels of endosymbiosis. Now we talked about many examples of plant and animal diseases caused by microbial eukaryotes. This included a wide range of things, including really important diseases like malaria, which has multiple hosts, not only mosquitoes, but humans, to other things that were really culturally significant, things like oomycetes that caused the potato late blight. If you have Irish ancestry and you live in the United States and you're not a recent immigrant, likely it was the result of um, your ancestors fleeing Ireland during this famine. Lots of other examples were present. We talked about Chagas disease. We talked about the brain-eating amoeba. We talked about Giardia. We also talked about some of these other things like um, the oomycete that causes sudden oak death. Either way, there's lots of examples within microbial eukaryotes of significant pathogens to humans and human society. One of the other groups that we talked about really challenges our understanding and definition of multicellularity. Remember, multicellularity evolved multiple times. And if you look at the slime molds, both the plasmodial slime molds, which are shown on the left here, and the cellular slime molds on the right, you see that they kind of have some weird features of their life cycle that make us sort of really start to think a little bit more deeply about what we mean about multicellularity. In something like a plasmodial slime mold, the, even though it's a large organism, it's effectively one single cell that has many, many, many nuclei. Now, when conditions are not going well, this um, single individual can form fruiting bodies, which then disperse sort of reproductive spores that can grow into new individuals. So this one is really interesting in that it's a single cell with multiple nuclei, but in cellular slime molds, you have kind of the opposite, where you have the actual organism living most of its life as a uh, sort of little amoeba, a unicellular amoeba, but then when it's time for reproduction, they congregate and end up forming slugs that eventually grow into these fruiting bodies that again disperse spores. Now, this is good in terms of our definition because we have a stock where the cells are not involved in reproduction, and then a head where they actually are, but this only occurs in part of its life cycle. So in that way, it's a lot like stigmatella. Stigmatella has a similar kind of thing where only part of its life cycle is truly multicellular. The next group we'll focus on are the plants. So one of the really important things to keep in mind about plants is that they really play key roles in ecosystems. So not only are they carbon fixers, but their interactions with other organisms really keep the planet alive. So they're really important for human society, for example, not only uh, for our food, but also for our clothes, our energy through coal, um, medicine, and housing. So they've played really important and key roles in the development of human society, still do. And one of the amazing things that I always emphasize is that really from outer space, plants are the only organisms that you can see. With so much green, there must be some really important impacts. The defining feature of plants is their ability to do photosynthesis using chloroplasts that are the result of primary endosymbiosis. Remember, all plants have chloroplasts that are descendant from the original cell that engulfed a cyanobacterium. Algae usually refers to several early diverging plant lineages, all of which are aquatic. You have to be careful Sometimes algae are also used to refer to things like brown algae or kelp, 
which are not even plants. Either way, algae are not a monophyletic group. Glaucophytes really stand out as interesting because they retain a layer of peptidoglycan from their original endosymbiosis, the cyanobacteria. So this is, again, really good support that the chloroplast er arose from endosymbiosis. There is a general trend in land plants towards a more complete adaptation to life on land. So much of this is related to their life cycle, and that's why we really spend so much time in lecture going over life cycles. And it's associated with the changing role of the gametophyte and sporophyte generations. So over on the left, we have our phylogeny of land plants. Remember, all land plants have alternation of generations. So at least initially, it starts out as homosporic, or one size of spore, alternation of generations. The sporophyte is the multicellular diploid stage, and the gametophyte is the multicellular haploid stage. One thing to notice, again, is that plants produce gametes by mitosis. There is no change in ploidy from the gametophyte to the gametes. Gametes are unicellular, but they then fuse to form a unicellular zygote, which then divides by mitosis to grow into a sporophyte. Spores are the structures, and the, the spores in land plants are interesting because they are resistant to desiccation due to a special protein coating called sporopollenin. So that's the only structure that's produced by meiosis, and spores eventually end up growing by mitosis into gametophytes. The plant body includes a variety of tissues and organs. First, it's important to recognize the above ground part of the plant, which is usually referred to as the shoot system, and the below ground part of the plant, which is referred to as the root system. Now, plants have indeterminate growth. They continue to grow throughout their entire lives in most places where there are meristems. So the most important meristems are the shoot apical meristem, sometimes abbreviated as SAM, and the root apical meristem, sometimes abbreviated as RAM. Now there's also lots of tissues on the plant body. There's the dermal tissue, which secretes a waxy layer that prevents the plant from desiccating. There's the vascular tissue, which is illustrated in green here, and transports sugars and water. And then everything in between is ground tissue. And ground tissue has lots of different functions, but for now, we can just think of it as filling in the space in between the dermal and vascular tissues. Primary growth occurs in all plants using the shoot apical meristem and root apical meristem. This is growth that is adding height, either by growing up or by growing down using the root apical meristem. Secondary growth occurs in seed plants, except in monocots where it's been lost, using something called a bifacial vascular cambium. Remember, this is uh, using that special layer that's only present in seed plants, and it adds width or girth to the plant. One of the great examples of this is by looking at tree, tree rings, which alternate depending on the season. Bryophytes are the amphibians among plants. They're still really closely tied to water, and they lack xylem and phloem, so they lack devoted tissues for water and sugar transport. One other thing that's uh, interesting about them is that the dominant generation in a bryophyte is the gametophyte. So most of the plant body is composed of the gametophyte, and you have a sporophyte that is nutritionally dependent and attached to the gametophyte. So if you look at something like a liverwort here, one of the things that you see is all this sort of green stuff that looks kind of like little trees is actually still an extension of the gametophyte tissue. And the sporophyte is just that little 
yellow structure that's beneath there. In a moss, it gets a little bit bigger, so we see the main gametophyte generation here and the sporophyte being attached and growing up, forming that special capsule called a sporangium at the top. And then in hornworts, all of this stuff is gametophyte, and then you have the horn, which is the sporophyte. So you sort of see this trend with the increased size of the sporophyte. And then in, in hornworts, it's actually a nutritionally uh, sort of independent, mostly part of the plant. It's, it can't be detached from the gametophyte, but it is green and thus can do its own photosynthesis. Now, despite being really uh, reliant still on water for things like reproduction, the sperm have to swim through water to reach the egg, um, bryophytes still have amazing tolerance to desiccation. They can dry down all the way down to 0% water and still survive. This characteristic is called poikilohydry, and that means that the water content within a bryophyte matches the water content of its environment. With tracheophytes, we see the evolution of vascular tissue. Vascular tissue has two parts. It's the xylem and the phloem. On the left here, we see the tracheids. Those are like the really super thin parts of the vascular tissue that conduct water of the xylem. And on the right, we see vessel elements, which are present in uh, one group of gymnosperms and most angiosperms. They're much larger and can transport more water. To the right of that, we see the phloem, which has two parts, the sieve tube element in which sugar flows and also a companion cell because the sieve tubes don't have organelles. The companion cell regulates the cell function. Now associated with the evolution of vascular tissue, you also have a shift from gametophyte to sporophyte dominance. And this is illustrated with the moss and fern here. Everything in gold color is gametophyte generation and the blue is the sporophyte. So we can see the sporophyte here being attached to the gametophyte. And in the fern, we see that the dominant part of the plant, the large part of the plant, is the sporophyte, and the gametophyte is off on its own and is much smaller. Lycophytes and manilophytes are the seedless vascular plants. They're sporophyte dominant and have an independent, free-living gametophyte. Just like the fern in the previous example, the gametophyte lives on its own. Spores are still the primary mechanism of dispersal, and the sperm have to swim through water to reach the egg. Now, lycophytes and manilophytes look pretty different from one another. On the left here, we can see selaginella. This one looks kind of a little bit like a fern. One thing to notice is that it does have these brown tips which are stroboli. If you zoom in, you can see that selaginella is an example of a lycophyte that independently evolved two sizes of spores. So cones, or stroboli, are stacked clusters of sporangia. Sporangia produce spores, which as we just mentioned, are the primary mechanism of dispersal in seedless vascular plants. Lycophytes also have very small leaves that have a single vein of vascular tissue. Most people call these microfills. In manilophytes, there's three main groups. The ferns, oftentimes called the leptosporangiate ferns, the horsetails, and the whisk ferns. On ferns, one thing that stands out is the undersurfaces of their leaves have clusters of sporangia, shown here as small reddish-brown bands, called sori. Sori produce spores. Horsetails, though, have something totally different. They have their sporangia clustered, just like in lycophytes, into stroboli, or cones. And then whisk ferns have little yellow balls, which are clusters of sporangia that are located at the nodes. So again, three different arrangements of sporangia in manilophytes. 
The transport of water in plants is passive. That means it doesn't rely on energy, on ATP. Instead, it's sort of reliant on the fundamental properties of water. Those fundamental properties are cohesion, where water molecules stick to other mo molecules via hydrogen bonds, and adhesion, where water molecules stick to other things using different kinds of bonds. Now sugar is the opposite of water. Instead of being pulled from the roots through all the way to the shoot system, um, it, sugar is actually requiring ATP, but it requires ATP at a couple different places. So first, a sugar flows from a source cell, such as something you would find in a leaf, to a sink cell, something that you would find, for example, in like a fruit or a root, and ATP is requ required for the offloading of sugars from the source cell and the onloading of sugars, if you would, from the phloem sap into the sink cell. Now this is all ultimately tied to water, which effectively pushes the sugars around. So this model is a little bit different than what you might expect in terms of osmosis. And in effect, you have a push-pull kind of mechanism in order to drive sugar flow, again using ATP. Seed plants include the gymnosperms and angiosperms. Now, all seed plants have seeds, pollen, and secondary growth. Gymnosperms are best represented by conifers, although there are other groups we'll mention. And of course, angiosperms are the flowering plants. Now, keep in mind, pollen really has an important role in seed plants, serving to disperse from one plant to another, either by wind or by some other kind of animal mediation, but it effectively delivers sperm directly to the egg. Seeds are a way that plants protect the next sporophyte generation. They all have the same fundamental components, i.e. a seed coat, some kind of nutritive tissue, and then the next sporophyte generation. Seed plants also have that secondary growth we mentioned before, where they can grow much wider. Think of something like this redwood tree, which is very, very, very wide. Angiosperms also have that, except monocots lost it. And so monocots tend to not ever get as wide as something like a gymnosperm or an angiosperm with secondary growth. All seed plants have seeds and pollen. Seeds are really a way of protecting and effectively dispersing the next sporophyte generation. They all have the same fundamental parts. They both have an embryo, they all have an embryo, which is the next sporophyte generation and is diploid. There's some kind of nutritive tissue and there's a seed coat. Now I compare gymnosperm and angiosperm seeds because gymnosperms don't produce fruit, number one, which is reflected by the ovary wall in green here. That's what eventually becomes the fruit in an angiosperm. But also because the nutritive tissue in gymnosperms is haploid versus the nutritive tissue in angiosperms, which is triploid and the product of double fertilization. All seed plants are also heterosporous. They make seeds and disperse the male gamete using pollen. Pollen is the traveling microgametophyte. So if you look at a heterosporous life cycle here on the left, you see that the microgametophyte is the pollen grain. Pollen disperse either through air or are um, animal mediated and eventually deliver sperm directly to the egg using a pollen tube. So in this gymnosperm example, a pollen tube is growing and will grow all the way to reach the egg in the female gametophyte or megagametophyte, which is shown here. If we look more closely at angiosperms, two sperm are delivered in the pollen tube instead of just one as in gymnosperms. 
One sperm fertilizes the egg. The egg here is in the middle of the megagametophyte in um, angiosperms. And then the other egg fertilizes the central cell. Here shown uh, with the two polar nuclei, which are N plus N. So the fusion of the single sperm cell, which is haploid, with the polar nuclei results in the production of that special nutritive tissue, which is triploid. Last but not least, in angiosperms, the ovary wall develops eventually into the fruit. So the fruit of angiosperms comes from, usually, the ovary wall, and gymnosperms don't make it because they lack ovaries. Gymnosperms make seeds and have pollen, but they do not make fruit. Again, they lack ovaries. They do have separate male and female cones. The male cones are oftentimes referred to as pollen cones, and they are the soft, squishy ones like are shown in this conifer in the bottom left. In the top, you have a female cone, which tends to be larger and woody. If you look inside of these, you can see that there is, event, or at first, a megasporangium that's associated with the female cone. Each scale has its own pair of megasporangia. And in the male, you see that there are microsporangia filled with microspores that will eventually develop into pollen grains. In something like a cycad, again, you get really, really massive cones. Here are a couple of female cones. Ginkgo make cones as well, but they're much smaller. Well, Wichia makes a series of smaller cones, both male and female cones. These are the male cones. One thing that really stands out as interesting is that some cones don't really open up until they're exposed to some sort of environmental trigger. This is called serotony, a classic example of which are these lodgepole pines the cones of which only open after fire. Angiosperms are the most diverse lineage of plants. They have flowers, fruit, and vessel elements. The majority of our food comes from or is directly tied to angiosperms in some way. If you look in terms of diversity, one of the things that you see is that the overwhelming amount of plant diversity is all in the flowering plants. So there must be some good reasons for this. One obvious example are flowers. So flowers are specialized structures that are composed of whorls um, of modified leaves, one of which has been folded to incorporate and protect the megasporangium. Remember, in seed plants, the spores never leave the parent plant. And so in angiosperms, the flower really covers and encloses and protects that megasporangium, eventually growing into a megagametophyte that's only seven cells big, gets fertilized, forms a seed, and then the ovary is what develops into a fruit. Also present in angiosperms are vessel elements. Vessel elements are capable of transporting a lot more water than associated tracheids. Remember, not all seed plants have vessel elements, just angiosperms and one group of gymnosperms, the nidophytes. There's also some differences between the groups in angiosperms, i.e. the eudicots and the monocots, Namely, in eudicots, there's two embryonic seed leaves, and in the monocot, there's just one. You can oftentimes tell which is which when you first see these seeds germinating. In eudicots, you see those two leaves um, coming up, and in a monocot, you just see one. First, let's define a bigger picture here and put fungi into the context of the tree of life. So opisthoconts are defined by having a single posterior flagellum. And opisthoconts include fungi, which we're going to focus on now, but also coenoflagellates in animals. 
When you think single posterior flagellum, you should start thinking about things like a sperm cell where you have one cell and one flagellum extending out the back. Notice that in contrast to what some people often think, plants um, are not really a part of this. Fungi, in fact, are a lot more closely related to animals than they are to plants at all. Although most people associate fungi with mushrooms, that's really only one part of the sexual stage of the life cycle in really one group, the, the basidiomycota. In ascomycota, you also get a fruiting body, but really the basidiomycota are where you see the classic mushrooms. The defining feature of the fungal body are multicellular filaments called hyphae. These comprise the majority of the fungal body. And they're important because they secrete enzymes directly into the environment. And that process is called absorptive heterotrophy. This is how a fungus feeds. So if you look at this mushroom on the left, one thing that's important to understand is that it's comprised of lots and lots and lots and lots of hyphae. Collections of hyphae, which are microscopic, um, are ultimately seen in this, like in this picture on the right here, and that is called a mycelium. So a mycelium is a collection of those um, multicellular filamentous strands called hyphae. Because their chemistry can be directly accessed because of their absorptive heterotrophy, this has made fungi really important in the biosynthesis of drugs, enzymes, acids, alcohols, and even microprotein meat substitutes. So for example, um, fungi are used to produce most of the citric acid that we use, which is a really important food preservative. Fungi have also been crucial to the development of statins. Statins were first discovered in fungi and have saved countless lives. And then mycoprotein, which are new kinds of proteins that are being developed as meat substitutes, and they're entirely derived from fungi. If you look at fungi overall, you'll realize that the diversity of fungi is really poorly understood, partly reflected by the polytomy shown in this phylogeny, but this is it's really concentrated in unicellular groups where we just don't know enough about them. Most of our focus in Biz2C is on the dicaria. Remember the dicaria form that special structure called a dicarion, and it includes ascomycota and basidiomycota, but there's lots of other groups that we briefly mentioned, including things like microsporidians, which can be important in human health, chytrids, which have been partly implicated in amphibian decline, zygomycota, which, inform, which forms many important bread molds, and glomeromycota, which are really important for most plant health because they form arbuscular mycorrhizae. The dicaria include the ascomycota and the basidiomycota, each of which has distinctive um, feature called the dicarion, which is an N plus N stage as part of the life cycle. So we have a single cell with two haploid nuclei that have not united. Now in basidiomycota, once fertilization happens, i.e. those nuclei fuse, you ultimately get the, the, the development of a structure called a basidium. And a basidium has four spores externally. You can see three spores easily here on the top right. One, two, three, the fourth one's sort of hiding behind there. And then in the ascomycota, you get the development of an ascus, which has eight spores in a sac. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. One important thing to note about the life cycle of fungi is that there are not motile gametes. Instead, the nuclei act as the motile gametes. Also, in fungi, while spores are produced in a sexual part of the life cycle via meiosis, spores can also be produced asexually by mitosis. Fungi rely on spores as a means of dispersal, 
In fungi, spores can be the product of sexual reproduction, such as we just showed you in the previous slide, or asexually. Most of the time, when we look at petri dishes in lab in Biz2C, we're seeing the product of this asexual reproduction. Sometimes these are referred to as mitospores because they're produced by mitosis. Some molds only ever undergo re sexual reproduction rarely, and most of the time, all of what you see is produced by asexual reproduction, which can happen really, really fast. The fruiting bodies produce and disperse the spores. The spores grow mitotically into new hyphae and can be dispersed by wind, but there's lots of other strategies. I showed you some examples in lecture. Here's a puffball showing a great example of wind dispersed spores. We saw the bird's nest fungi, which are an example of water dispersed spores. The polobolus fungi, or cannonball fungi, which disperse spores by pressure. And then subterranean fungi, which are oftentimes dispersed by animals. And here is this truffle that lives in California that's dispersed by flying squirrels. We also used fungi in Biz2C to discuss pathogens and virulence. Remember, pathogens are organisms that cause disease and virulence is a measure of how much damage a pathogen causes once it's overcome the host defenses. We saw lots of examples of pathogens in bacteria. Here's Mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy. We also saw lots of examples of pathogens in microbial eukaryotes, which we mentioned previously, like Plasmodium, which causes malaria. But fungi also have lots of pathogens as well. So for example, histoplasmosis, which is in soil, and coccidioides, which causes valley fever and is also present in soil. One interesting aspect that we discussed in lecture about pathogens was that there are some fungi that produce mycotoxins. Mycotoxins include things like aflatoxin. And aflatoxin is produced by a special fungus called aspergillus. Now, one strain of aspergillus, aspergillus oryzae, is also used to produce fermented sauces like soy sauce. But if you look at the phylogeny of aspergillus, you see that a oryzae is nested within this really complex um, relation, set of relationships among Aspergillus fungi. It's only one lineage among this big tree here, and so people that oftentimes make home-brewed soy sauce inadvertently expose themselves to the Aspergillus that produces aflatoxin, and a chronic exposure to that could end up causing liver cancer. Aorizi doesn't produce the aflatoxin, but you have to have some strict microbial controls to make sure that you're using the right strain. We also saw the effect of introduced species. We talked about white nose syndrome. Remember, white nose syndrome is a pathogen killing bats across the United States and is an introduced species likely from Europe. When you make a phylogeny of the genus that causes white nose syndrome and its relatives, you see that the one that infects bats really occurs nowhere near any other place in North America, likely originated in Europe and got here on accident but is now decimating bat populations. So because these bats didn't evolve in concert with this pathogen, they don't have any natural immunity and that's one of the reasons they're so inadvertently affected. Lichens are symbiotic organisms, and they have a couple of different parts. One is usually an ascomycete fungus, but then also associated with that is a cyanobacterium and or a green algae. Recently, based on the article that you read, you learned that there could be a basidiomycete yeast involved, 
and that's not in all species, but in many, and that Basidiomycete yeast produces some acids that offer some protection to the lichen. One thing that's interesting is that if you separate the symbionts from the lichen, you see that the photobiont, i.e. the cyanobacteria or green algae, can live on its own, but the fungal symbiont cannot. So the fungal partner is obligately dependent on the photobiont. Other symbioses involving fungi are mycorrhizae, and these are ancient symbioses that happen between fungi and plants. There's a couple different kinds. One is rare, that's an ectomycorrhizae, and that those form a protective covering around plant roots and are only present in a few percent of plants. The one that we spoke about most were, most were endomycorrhizae, and endomycorrhizae actually penetrate the plant cells, and these occur in about 85% of all plants. One of the things that's interesting is that with the association of the fungal partner to the plant, you get a great expansion of surface area. That increased expansion of surface area allows the plant more efficient uptake, not only of water, but also of essential micronutrients. The fungus, in return, gets, gets some sugars. In the bottom right here, you can see two plants. The one on the right, which is much larger and looks healthier, was actually grown with mycorrhizae. The one on the left has no mycorrhizae, so it can clearly have a really significant effect. This brings us to our last group in bis to see the animals. First, let's think about coanoflagellates. Remember, coanoflagellates are the sister group of animals. They're mostly unicellular, but also form colonies. And a few species form colonies, which are called rosettes, when in the presence of certain bacteria. The rosette structure, to me, really is reminiscent of that blastula. And so many people have kind of used this as an argument sort of to suggest that perhaps some, some kind of symbiosis with bacteria was involved in the original evolution of animal multicellularity. Now when you look at coenoflagellate body form, it's really interesting to note that the primary cell type in sponges closely resembles coenoflagellates. They have a main body with a flagellum and microvilli. And what happens is, as the flagellum beats, water is drawn across the microvilli and food particles are trapped, which are eventually consumed by phagocytosis. So coenoflagellates probably have something to say about the evolution of multicellularity in animals. We stress this in BIS2C lecture quite a bit, but I just want to emphasize that deep relationships among animals remain controversial. The problems are really centered largely around the position of one group, the tenophores, but really are also related to the way that we focus on animal relationships through a bilaterian sort of point of view. This is a really biased point of view that makes us kind of look at animals that don't have a lot of the systems, organs, or tissues that mammals have as somehow primitive, and that's just not true. We asked you to read a couple of articles as we um, worked through animals, both of which really emphasize this point of view. This is the phylogeny that I like to use when thinking about animals, and I think it's a little bit better than some of the other phylogenies that you see because it actually shows the uncertainty related to the position of tenophores. So I'm representing tenophores here in a polytomy with peripherins and the rest of animals. Animals are definitely a monophyletic group, but despite the fact that they're easily recognized, they don't have very many synapomorphies that uniquely define them. There are some, though, that are worth considering. One is multicellularity. The second is that they have unique junctions between their cells. Third, they have an extracellular matrix that's made largely of collagen and proteoglycans. And last, they have a blastula stage as part of their development. 
Now we've talked about multicellularity before, and we recognize that it's evolved multiple times on the tree of life. But it's still a synapomorphy of animals because the kind of multicellularity in animals is unique to them. Evidence that supports this are those different types of cell-to-cell -cell junctions, tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. Several other different groups also make an extracellular matrix that are not animals, but the extracellular matrix in animals is unique to them because it's comprised largely of non-living collagen and proteoglycans. So despite the fact that other organisms do secrete an ECM, including things like Volvox, which are colonial, the animal ECM is unique. Also associated with animals is a stage in their development called the blastula, which is essentially a hollow ball of cells. There is an external layer, which is sometimes called the blastoderm or the ectoderm. And then on the inside is a space that's fluid filled called the blastocele. Again, all animals make a blastula in their development, but some make quite a bit more than that. So animals go through very specific stages as part of their embryonic development. And these embryonic tissue layers become different structures in the adult organisms. All animals, like I mentioned previously, have a blastula, and all those animals with a gut have a gastrula. So here we can see the fertilized egg undergoing mitosis to eventually form a solid ball of cells, which we don't really talk about much, called a morula, and then eventually making a hollow ball of cells, which is an, a synapomorphy of animals called the blastula. Now in animals that have a gut, eventually you get kind of a dimpling in of this blastula, which is the blastopore, eventually forming this internal space called the gastrocele. And if you look over in this less 3D image, you can see that once you have the formation of a gastrula, you have two tissue layers, the outside layer called the ectoderm and the inside layer called the endoderm. Now in some other animal groups, notably the bilaterians, you also get the development of a third tissue layer called mesoderm. So if you have two tissue layers, you're diploblastic. If you have all three, then you are triploblastic. Although they lack tissues or organs and don't have very many different cell types, sponges are really not simple or primitive animals. It's easy to sort of be tricked into thinking that. In fact, their fossil record goes back 600 million years, so they've definitely stood the test of time. The sponge body has some important features. First, they have not very many different kinds of cells, but many of those cells retain the ability to change into other cell types, which is called totipotency. They also have spicules, which are rods of varying chemical composition that serve in defense and support. One thing you'll notice is that one conspicuous cell type in sponges is called the coenocyte, and coenocytes look a lot like coenoflagellates. One difference that you would definitely see is that the coenocytes are embedded in an extracellular matrix, whereas coenoflagellates are their own independent, mostly unicellular lineage. Last and really important about sponges is that they have a way of feeding using something called the principle of continuity. So the phylum name for sponges is porifera, and porifera means they have lots and lots and lots of holes. So if you look at the sponge body, they have many, many, many inputs. In fact, if you added up the surface area of all those inputs, it would be really high relative to their output called the osculum. So the osculum is a single output, and if you have this, then effectively you have this result where the water that is drawn in through all the outputs is extended out the single output 
forcefully such that the sponge is not recirculating the same water over and over again. Embedded in this sponge, which is not an askenoid sponge like some might be led to think, um, the tissue is really complex and folded in order to increase surface area and to give a chance for those coenocytes to do their thing and capture food particles. Tenophores are a poorly understood and difficult group to study in part because they're soft-bodied and difficult to work with. If indeed they are sister to the rest of metazoa, as has been supported by recent phylogenetic analyses, it really forces us to reconsider the evolution of several key characters, including things like muscles, neurons, and a complete gut. If you look at the morphology of a tenophore, one of the things that you'll see is they have a mouth and a series of anal pores, which shows us they have a complete gut, complete one-way gut. Now, even though they sometimes look like um, sea jellies or cnidarians, one of the things that stands out is that in addition to that complete gut, they don't have nidi or nidocytes. Instead, they have other kinds of cells. They can have tentacles, and these tentacles have something called lasso cells, which they can use to trap prey. Either way, they move using their teens, which are rows of cilia that beat, oftentimes giving them that sort of magical, translucent, very colorful appearance as they go through the water. Now, these guys can be really unusual, and we saw some in lecture that closely resembled sea jellies, but they can even be things like shining sort of ribbons that float through the water with their teens and all kinds of other shapes. So again, we don't really know much about them, but genetically at least, and a lot of their morphology suggests that they are a very interesting group in the context of animal evolution. Cnidarians are diploblastic. That means that they have two tissue layers, ectoderm and endoderm, and they also have muscles, a non-living jelly-like material called mesoglia, and an uncentralized nerve net. The most conspicuous cell type is the nidocyte, which is famous because it's the stinging cell that stings using something called a nematocyst. In the bottom center here, you can see that we have a nidocyte with a nidocyl trigger and a nematocyst that everts to penetrate whatever thing that the cnidarian is actually stinging. Many species have a dimorphic life cycle. That means that they have two distinct stages. One is a free swimming stage that's involved in sexual reproduction called a medusa. The other is a sessile stage, which is called a polyp. Now the polyp and medusa are not always present in all groups. So for example, the anthozoa lack a medusa stage, but in many groups you have both stages, the polyp and the medusa. Cnidarians are really important because they form some key symbioses, one of which are corals. So corals are anthozoan cnidarians that have formed a symbiosis with dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae. Remember, we can connect the importance of coral reefs to fish diversity, where the bulk of fish species live in coral reefs. Also associated with this are free-floating colonies like the Portuguese man-of-war called siphonophores. Remember, siphonophores are composed of several individualized special zoids and are not really a single individual. They kind of test our limits of understanding, biologically at least, what a single individual is. Now, despite the fact that they're diploblastic, um, and you may think that they're kind of simple animals, again, this is another exception. Many of these cnidarians are really complex. One good example are the box jellies, which have an image-forming eye, which includes a lens and a retina. One amazing thing is that they're able to use this to navigate their environment 
yet they don't have a centralized nervous system, there is no brain. Moving on to bilaterians, really the story of bilaterian evolution is tied to their development. All bilaterians have bilateral symmetry, at least at some stage in their life cycle, and that third tissue layer called mesoderm. Now the pattern of cell division, which is called cleavage, is different between protostomes and deuterostomes. In protostomes, cell fate is determined early by the deposition of messenger RNAs in the egg cytoplasm. This is called spiral mosaic cleavage. In contrast, deuterostomes have cell fate determined late by chemical gradients, and this is called radial regulative cleavage. You can see that the two cleavage types sort of produce different looking embryos. That spiral part comes because as cell division proceeds, the next set of cells sort of occupies the spaces in between cells, whereas in the radial cleavage, you get more of a stacked appearance, a more even division of cells. Deuterostomes and protostomes both can be coelomate animals. So in deuterostomes, you always have a coelom, which is a fluid-filled internal body cavity. And in deuterostomes, it's only ever formed by pinching off of mesodermal cells during development. This is called enterocele. In protostomes, if you are coelomate, so the coelom is formed by the splitting of mesodermal cells in development. But keep in mind, in protostomes, you can also be acelomate, not have a coelom at all, or you can be pseudocelomate, in which case the coelom is incompletely surrounded by mesodermal cells and still partly attached to the endoderm. The lophotrochozoans share a larval stage called a trochophore, which is a ciliated free-swimming larval stage, and they almost all, lophotrochozoans share a larval stage called a trochophore larva, which is a free-swimming ciliated larval stage, and some have a unique feeding structure called a lophophore. This is how we get their name, Lophotrochozoa. In Biz2C, we really focus on two groups within the Lophotrochozoa, the mollusks and the annelids. The mollusks really are examples of animals with extreme differences in body morphology and feeding ecology. They are extremely varied and can look very different from one another. They can be both aquatic and terrestrial. They have open or closed circulatory systems, internal or external fertilization, etc. So these guys really can be very, very different from one another. As you saw in lab in Biz2C, we dissected a bivalve and we dissected a squid and they look nothing like one another, yet those parts can be easily homologized between those two radically different organisms. Cephalopods are a really great example of these extremes. They're active predators with image-forming eyes, complex behavior, and even cells that can change their color and texture called chromatophores. So again, mollusks can be aquatic or terrestrial. Here's an example of a sea snail and a bivalve. The sea snail spends at least part of its time above water, above the water line, grazing using its radula to scrape algae off of rocks. They can be herbivorous, so something like this chitin scrapes algae off of rocks. They can be filter feeders like this bivalve or even predators. Here are great examples of external and or internal fertilization. If you're something like a bivalve, like this giant clam, you effectively release your gametes into the water. And if you are something like a squid, like these bobtail squid, 
you actually have complex mating behavior. We saw a video in a BIS2C lecture about the complex behavior involved in land snail reproduction using those calcified love darts. Now associated with this is the fact that mollusks can be sometimes cephalized, i.e. here is this beautiful image forming eye on this cuttlefish, or even uncephalized. And this is part really, partly related to how they feed. We use annelids in BIS2C to illustrate the example of a complete one-way processing gut, but also locomotion and various feeding strategies. Earthworms in this regard serve as a really good example because they show what is involved in adapting to life on land. Remember that annelids have a hydrostatic skeleton that includes circular muscles, longitudinal muscles, and paired CD. In polychaetes, these paired CD are situated on extensions called parapodia, but on earthworms, the paired CD are just attached directly to the, to the body. And remember, they are made of chitin. So there's another example of the evolution of chitin. Remember, in earthworms, because water is not compressible, they use a combination of that hydrostatic skeleton, muscles, and paired CD for locomotion. When you dissect an earthworm, it's really clear that you can see that there are multiple organs involved in digesting its food. So you have a pharynx that pulls in soil. There's an esophagus that's not listed here, but then it pushes this soil down into a crop and a gizzard and eventually out the intestine, breaking down the food further and further as it goes. So each organ is specialized to do a certain job. Now, we also use polychaetes to sort of give some examples of different feeding strategies, namely filter feeding, like in the feather duster worms, and deposit feeding, which is involved in the spaghetti worms, where we're waiting for food particles to slowly trickle out of the water column. And then here are predator, predatory polychaetes, which actually have an invertible pharynx and jaws. Ecdysozoans are the most diverse group in terms of numbers of species on the tree of life, and this diversity is really concentrated in the arthropods, especially in hexapods, the insects. They all share a chitinous exoskeleton or cuticle that is periodically molted. So this doesn't only happen in arthropods, it also happens in nematodes. So here's an arthropod molting, Here's another example of an arthropod, a crab pulling out of its old exoskeleton. But here is a nematode, and if you look closely, you can see it's peeling slowly away from its external cuticle. So all ecdysozoans do ecdysis. There are really abundant and diverse animals on our planet and in the tree of life. And so if you look at nematodes, they may not occupy too much in terms of diversity, but arthropods really occupy this huge range of diversity. And we start out by focusing on four groups, the chelicerates, which includes the spiders, scorpions, and ticks, the myriapods, the millipedes and centipedes, the malacostricans, which includes the crabs, the shrimps, and the lobsters, and then the hexapods. So these are the real big four groups within the broader ecdysozoa that really explain a lot of its diversity. Within this, the panarthropoda includes all of the traditionally defined arthropods, but also includes two groups called the onycophorans, or velvet worms, and the tardigrades, which are here. In our class, in BIS2C, we really focus on just four of these. The chelicerates, represented here by the horseshoe crab, the myriapods, the malacostricans, and the hexapods. All arthropods share some common features, most notably a ventral nervous system and segmentation.
In many groups, these segments are fused together to perform specialized functions, which are called tagmata. And there are different numbers of tagmata depending on the arthropod group. So in something like a chelicerate, like this spider, we see two tagmata. In something like this centipede, we see a couple tagmata, but lots of different segments here that um, comprise the body. And in something like this melacostrican, we see that there's really two, but then again, lots of a separate segments that are extended later on as part of the abdomen. In hexapods, you have three, a head, thorax, and abdomen, etc. So we have different numbers of tagmata depending on the group. Now, segmentation is something that definitely stands out in arthropods, and it's important to remember that segmentation is not a homologous character on the tree of life. It occurs multiple times, once in arthropods, but also in annelids, i.e. the segmented worms, and also in chordates, one piece of evidence that argues for their independent evolution is that they are formed from different embryonic tissue layers. Pancrustacea includes the traditionally defined crustaceans, i.e. the crabs, shrimps, and lobsters, plus the hexapods. The hexapods are the insects. And while the crustaceans are mostly marine, like crabs, shrimp, and lobsters, although there are some exceptions, the hexapods are mostly terrestrial. So it's helpful to think of insects as the land-based crustaceans. Crabs, shrimps, and barnacles are melacostricans that you see in Biz2C labs. There's a lot of others that we don't talk about, but they have some defining features. First, they have three tagmata with the head and the thorax fused into a carapace. Unlike insects, they have two different pairs of sensory antennae. And like insects, oftentimes their appendages are greatly modified. And I use the example in Biz2C lecture of the mantis shrimp with its specialized appendages for smashing prey. Insects are the most diverse animals in the tree of life. There are innumerable life history strategies and many species play really important roles, not only in human society, but ecologically as a whole. In human society, they're key for pollination, they are pests, and oftentimes vectors of disease. And so if you look at the insect body plan, you see three separate tagmata, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They also have a fine network of tubes called a tracheal system, which helps them in respiration that open to the outside air via pores called spiracles. And within insects, there's really two main groups. One is the paleoptera, and one is the neoptera. Now there's a third group, which are the integnathous insects, which don't have flight. So not all insects can fly, but the two most diverse lineages can, i.e. the Paleoptera and the Neoptera. Within the Neoptera, there's two important developmental processes. One is called incomplete metamorphosis, represented here by the um, grasshopper, where you have a fertilized egg that hatches and grows through a series of stages called nymphs. Now the adults and the nymphs feed on the same food source usually, although the food source can be somewhat varied. In contrast, insects with complete metamorphosis, you have an egg hatching into a larval stage that eats a completely different food source than the adult. The adult has a, uh, emerges from a pupal stage, which is actually a non-feeding stage. It's a cocoon where the animal is completing its development. Now in both of these cases, only the winged adults are reproductive. Now among animals, echinoderms are hugely unusual. They have not only unusual symmetry, the pentaradial symmetry, 
but they also have some interesting organ systems that are unique to them, such mm -hmm. as the water vascular system, and even some tissues like catch collagen and tube feet, which are really different from any other animal group. If you look at the uh, like a classical sea star as a Cnidarian ex example, you see that there is a top side, which is the aboral side, and that includes an opening, which is called the madreporite, which lets in water to the water vascular system, which is at least first a central ring, and then a series of canals that connect the tube feet, but also the anus is located on this aboral surface. On the oral surface, you have a stomach, at least in sea stars, that is eversible. It can be extended into the shell, usually of a mollusk, to kind of have a method of external fertile, um, digestion where enzymes are secreted outside the body. And here you can see the sea star having used its water vascular system to move to its prey, used its water vascular system and muscles to attach the tube feet to the shell, slowly pull it apart, crack it open, and then insert its eversible stomach to digest that muscle where it lives, outside of the main body of the sea star. There's lots of different examples of groups in echinoderms, all of which have a bilaterally symmetrical bipinaria larva shown here. Now, many of these groups look pretty different from one another. One obvious difference is that some of these groups have reinvented bilateral symmetry. One example is a sand dollar, and another example is a sea, cucum sea cucumber. It's really important to understand that ancestrally, all bilaterians are bilateral, but echinoderms invented their own unique kind of symmetry called pentaradial, which was then later modified by sand dollars and sea cucumbers into a new version of bilateral symmetry. So this bilateral symmetry is not necessarily homologous to the bilateral symmetry present in all other bilaterians. Chordata includes animals with a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a notochord, and a post-anal tail. Now, these features are really standout features, and if you look at this amphioxus here, you can see that the notochord is situated beneath the dorsal hollow nerve cord. The notochord is a stiff, flexible rod that is used to help the animal actually in locomotion. It gives the muscles something to push up against. The post-anal tail, of course, is involved in locomotion. Many uh, people think that the pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal gill slits, which are used in both feeding and respiration are a synapomorphy of chordates, but they actually occur in groups outside of chordata, so they're not a strict synapomorphy. Now that dorsal hollow nerve cord is interesting because it is derived from folding of the ectoderm. So if you look at the cross sections here, the neural tube indicated here is the dorsal hollow nerve cord that is formed from the folding, the embryonic folding of the ectoderm. Neural crest cells later dif differentiate into other kinds of parts of the central nervous system. One common question is, how is a tunicate even a chordate? It lacks all the features that I just mentioned. It doesn't have a dorsal hollow nerve cord or a notochord or a postanal tail. And the answer is, is that their larvae do. So these characters are present only in the juvenile stage of Ascidian tunicate larvae. They are present in the larvacean tunicates and all other chordates. So it doesn't have to be in the adult stage. It can also be in the juvenile stage where these synapomorphies are present. Within chordates, there's a general trend towards the evolution of life on land. But some fundamental features, namely a cranium, vertebrae, bone, and jaws all had to evolve first. If you look at this simplified phylogeny of chordates, you see we have the chordate synapomorphies listed here. 
a notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and a post anal tail. And you can see that we get the gradual evolution of these characters. Notable among these is the evolution of bone in astracoderms and placoderms, jaws in placoderms, and then the loss of bone in sharks and their relatives. So one thing that's interesting to note is that if we didn't have placoderms and astracoderms on this phylogeny, we might be tricked into thinking that bone evolved much later than it actually did. If you look more closely at vertebrae, one of the things you'll notice is that there are several points or processes where muscles attach. There's a thicker vertebral body, but then there's also this space, this hollow space in the middle. That's called a foramen, and that is where you get that dorsal hollow nerve cord extending through. It is actually protected by the bony vertebrae. In terms of jaws, one thing to notice is that jaws actually evolved from the ancestral arches that were used to support the pharyngeal slits. In fact, jaws represent the foremost arches coming together and being modified eventually with teeth to form what we now consider to be the vertebrate jaw. Some of the other bones that were part of these gill supports ended up forming your, the smallest bones in your body, your ear bones. If we zoom in on that phylogeny from the previous slide, one group that stands out are the bony fish. Now bony fish are usually referred to as a paraphyletic group unless you included tetrapods as part of that clade. In the context of the evolution of the bony fish, several organisms stand out, especially in the context of tetrapod evolution. One group are the coelacanths, or the lobe fin fish. And these are important because the lobe fin fish have a single bone that connects the fin to the body. This single bone is easily homologized with the tetrapod limb bones. So it gives us insight into the evolution of life on land and the tetrapod limb. Ray-finned fish have multiple bones that connect the body and are not easily homologized with the bones in the tetrapod limb. Associated with the evolution of tetrapods are two structures, the lungs and the swim bladder. Now, we saw in lecture that there is an animal called a lungfish, which has both gills and lungs. So it's important to first remember that an ancestral feature of chordates are the pharyngeal slits, which ancestrally function in feeding and respiration. So those are the gills. Later on, what happens is in the most recent common ancestor of osteichthians, we get the evolution of an outpocket of the digestive tract. And this is because this group ancestrally lived in oxygen poor conditions. And so they use this outpocketing of the digestive tract to gulp air. Later on in ray finned fish or actinopterygians, you get the evolution or the change of this ancestral outpocketing into a structure that they use to control buoyancy in the water, and that's called a swim bladder. But in tetrapods, you get the modification of this structure to form the tetrapod lung. So it's possible to have an animal with gills and a lung, since gills are an ancestral feature of chordates, but it's not possible to have an animal with lungs and a swim bladder. Terrestrial chordates include the amphibians and the amniotes. Amphibians are interesting because they're still reliant on water for respiration and reproduction. So their skin is still permeable and needs to be continuously moist in order for gas exchange to occur. Now with reproduction, they all have to return to water to complete their life cycle.
Here you can see two frogs. The male frog here, here is on top, and here's the female frog. This is called amplexus. The male attaches to the female and hangs on and doesn't let go until she gets to water and lays eggs. When she lays eggs, he releases sperm. The fertilized eggs then hatch into a juvenile stage called a tadpole that actually has gills. And slowly over time, this changes into an adult stage that ends up having lungs. So amphibians show remarkable transformation in their development. Amniotes, in contrast, have a shelled egg. And so one of the ways I like to think about this is that amniotes have a shelled egg and don't have to return back to water for reproduction. In effect, they've sort of made their own little habitat for the development of their offspring to occur. Now, amniotes also have several other features to help them adapt to life on land, including efficient kidneys and impermeable skin, but this shelled egg is a real standout feature, several membranes of which are homologous to the placenta in mammals. Mammals include chordates with several key features, including hair, sweat glands, and mammary glands. They also have a four-chambered heart. Birds have a four-chambered heart, but then this is another example of homoplasy. There's three main groups within mammals. One, the prototherians, which lay eggs, but still provide milk and don't have nipples. Instead, the young rely on patches on the mom's skin. There's the marsupials, in which the young are developed uh, are born underdeveloped. They still have a placenta, but the young are born underdeveloped and migrate to the pouch on the um, female's body. And then the eutherians, which are born, born much more developed relative to the marsupials. We'll end this with a discussion of humans, and I'd just say that humans are definitely amazing animals. We don't spend much time on them in Biz2C. We have many specialized features, including a large brain size. We have speech and extensive use of tools. But I think it's easy to forget, number one, that we're only one branch on the tree of life, but also that we're a relatively young species. Homo sapiens, at its oldest, is about 300,000 years old. And just 40,000 years ago, multiple species of Homo coexisted. And in the case of Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, we definitely interbred. And so, although Neanderthals are now extinct, some of their genes live on in Homo sapiens. And so we've reached the end of our Biz2C journey. I certainly hope that this video was helpful, and I wish you the best of luck on your final exam. Thank you.